Okay, give me just a moment here. Pop out chat so I can see it. I'll be painting here in just a minute. Oh. <coughs> And, uh, let's pop on this camera. As you can see, I've got the camera moved over here. And, uh, I have a Carlton that has already decided to flop into my lap. Carlton, say hello. Say hello. Uh, anyway. For those who are unaware of what I'm doing today, I am actually, oh, the green on my finger is because I wear a bronze ring and I haven't washed my hands since uh, this morning, turned my hand green. Anyway, I'm going to be painting miniatures today, not just this guy, but a bunch of other orcs I've made. So tonight we'll be painting these guys. Now. If you're watching this after the fact, down here, don't forget to like and subscribe. And that means, get down, little buddy. Get down. No, let go. Go on down on the floor. All right, good boy. No. No. Shoot. Anyway, like, subscribe, and hit that bell icon. And any cubic photon is what I printed all of these figures on. Now one of the first things that we're going to be doing so that all of them can can be done by the time like, it comes back around I primed it a medium gray. Okay. This is an armor wash mixture I've made. It's a blue-black armor wash. Oh, come on. There we go. Now, since this is going to be going on all of the figures, I'm going to be putting a good bit in my little palette here. I will probably... I probably wasted a bit, but there's also a chance I didn't put enough on. And I just realized I forgot my brushes. Let me grab them over here. Now, one thing I did, I have two separate cups of water. The one that is closest to me is for most colors. The one furthest from me is for metallics, because metallics leave behind little chips of mica and aluminum and that sort of thing. Now we're going to start off. I'm going to use a moderately large brush for this. This is a 5 brush, size 5. It is a cheapo brush. It is made by Plaid from Xuanqing. Xuanqing. Oh, Xuanqing. And its only purpose is to be spreading this on my model. And I'm going to get the brush just a little bit damp, just so that it'll carry the paint better, carry the ink better. What this is, the, the black that I'm painting on here, this is roughly similar to the uh, legendary Nuln Oil. Or as some of my friends like to call it because they heard me say it once and couldn't get the mispronunciation out of their head. Gnome Oil. Not used by gnomes, made from gnomes. But what I did, I have a mixture of uh, um, 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 distilled water, matte medium, and flow improver. And I then mixed that with a boatload, well not boatload, but with a good bit, a blue and black inks. The end result, as you can see on his face here, 
if it'll focus. Well, I get it. There we go. Is that it settles into the cracks just like Null Noil does. And we're going to paint this all over the whole figure because we want this. The purpose of this, before I paint anything else on, is I can be a little bit sloppy. Because what's happening is this paint, or this ink, this wash, whatever you want to call it, is settling into all the cracks, all the crevices, all the places that are indentations in the model. And then at places like borders between wood and metal, like on the face of this shield, it'll be a blue-black shade. So it will actually sit there and give us a divisor between the uh, areas of metal and areas of wood. Or in cases of like the uh, shoulder, areas of metal and areas of skin, or whatever I decide is actually underneath the armor here. Now, we're giving a nice liberal coat because this is going to be painted over anyway. I normally wouldn't give this heavy a coat onto anything. It'll also help us when we're painting because it'll help us pick out those details and see where one ends and another begins. Okay. For example, on this spear, it'll point out the difference where the, the blade begins and the wood ends. This will be easier to spot when we go to change paint colors. Now I will like to say that if you are thinking about when I put this, finally get this out, getting my orcs, I would highly recommend that you assemble them before you print them. Yes, you can print them and then glue them together, but because of tolerances, because of many other issues, it's entirely possible that you'll end up, well, it's entirely possible that you'll end up with pieces that don't fit. I mean, case in point, I had to almost force this guy onto the saddle, and even then, he doesn't exactly perfectly fit the saddle. And with the with the regular shapes, the regular figures over there, there are several whose arms have a big gap between the arm and the shoulder. And that's a problem. Gaps like that we can cover up with pl with armor plates, like these pauldrons that I put on him, that I'm currently painting over. But, yeah. Now, this is going to use more of this than anything else tonight, and that's this boar. Yes, he's rather boring. Now, one thing I'm not going to do is I'm not going to paint this onto the base yet. The base, I am not going to be detailing the base any more than it already is, and you can already see that it's pretty much ruined cobblestone that, has, that the desert has started to reclaim, so it's a Badlands type scenario. But what I will do is, once it comes time, I'll give it a nice dry brush of the colors that we want. One thing you'll also note is that the boar is wearing a chamfron, the, the armor piece. Uh, this wash helps pick out that armor piece. Pardon my sniffing, I have uh, sinus issues that when the weather starts really changing for, the, for good, really start kicking in. And 
And once this is done, I'll be moving on. I'll be doing this to the other four figures. Now, the thing is, what this means is that by the time I get that last figure done, this will be dry. And I'll be able to move on to the next paint color. If you're doing a large number of figures, it's really a good idea to go ahead and do, like, four or five per batch or more. Because even if you're doing a small area, like just the leather straps on some armor, then, you know, by the time you get to the last one, the first one will be dry. Okay. I got a little bit more on the uh, beaten metal there. Okay, now I'm going to set this over here. Next up is one of the ones I mentioned earlier that has an issue with the shoulders. It's the back of the right shoulder. Or left shoulder, rather. You know, yeah, right shoulder. No, left shoulder, yeah. This right here. No, this, yeah. Sorry, my brain is... Bleh. That's his right shoulder. But what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and paint them up. All, all of these that I print in the future, I'm going to go ahead and print and uh, few and assemble them before I print them. Assemble them in my modeling program. Now this is a savage orc, and what that means is he's basically a tribal orc from who knows where who has primitive weaponry and is prepared to drive out any invaders from his homeland. He's wearing a uh, wielding a stone sword as you can see and a maquattle. But at the same time he's kind of smiley. Now, some people don't like orcs having hair. I don't mind orcs having hair, but if you really don't like it, well, there are plenty of options in this set for no hair. Whether it's got a helmet, or just simply bald-headed, you can use whichever heads you want. If you don't like the idea of orcs wearing heavy armor, don't use the heavy armor bodies. Or arms, or legs. Or full helm heads. If you don't like these tribal orcs, don't use them. These are actually inspired by the Games Workshop Warhammer Savage Orcs. Although I think savage is rather insulting. And some of the implications are rather questionable. But in this case, I prefer tribal you could always say that the tribal orcs are less likely to be evil than the regular orcs because they don't have the viciously evil culture that Grummish promotes. So we go ahead and paint it. And like I said, it's, it's helping us get some paint in the borders between the different materials so that we can be a little sloppy. You don't have to go all the way to the edge because it's got a black line around it. Pardon me again for that sniffles. And some of you will notice that um, there's actually no one who has turned in yet. Nobody. Which is kind of disheartening. So... We're going to go up the Maquattle, and this guy's done. And if you notice, the Maquattle actually has little sigils inscribed in the uh, flat of it that this is picking up on.
Okay. I'm just going to make sure to get in between these teeth into the little depressions between them because it's got an area where these chips are embedded into the blade. Alright, that's that guy. Set him here. Here's the, ne here's the next one that had a problem with the fact that it's assembled. And again, you can see the cracks between the shoulder and the body. So we're going to go ahead and paint him and give him a wash. I should, I should note that what I'm painting over is pure primer. It may not look good over primer because this primer is, you know, a spray primer from, uh, from a Krylon. But it'll look better than nothing. So. Go ahead and Paint over these areas, and it also brings out details like the edges of this particular bowman's drawing arm have stitching on the edges of the uh, the uh, the bracer the, and the uh, backhand glove, and that stitching gets picked out by the wash. It's easier for you as a painter to see them. And the back of his bow arm bracer has lacing that goes that crisscrosses across. And again, it's easier to spot with the 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 wash that we've put on. Pardon me for a second. I'm having an issue with sinuses. Also, let me go ahead and make sure that I have this set to where it doesn't go down in quality. Yeah, I, I definitely like the new camera a lot better than the old. Okay. Now we're going to go ahead and continue down the hand to the bow. It is a bit of a fancy bow. This is the so-called advanced bow for more technologically advanced orcs, and I don't mean the ones that shoot guns at space marines. I mean ones that are like, you know, have their own civilization that's on par with the uh, human imperium on the continent of Kilimal Legasodomal. For whatever world your particular favorite war game takes place. And I can tell you right now, I'm probably going to go ahead and need to add some more of this wash onto my palette. Because I'm about to run out. You can barely see it, but it's starting to run low. And here we go. Now, come down this way on the bow. There we go. That's number three. Now we go back and glance at number one. And as you can see, when it finally focuses in... Come on. Well, ahem. Focus in. Yeah. It's still got some wet spots. 
Let me see if I can get a better... There we go. Let's see, is that better up close? Yeah, that's a bit better up close. You can see it's still got puddles that are still wet. So. Set him aside. Pull out the next guy, who is one that I assembled in my modeling program, and you can see there's no cracks. Well, there's a very minor one that's just a ridge. It's not an actual crack between the torso and the shoulders. And yes, it's another smiley boy with an axe and a shield. Meanwhile, let me go ahead and remind people in the uh, Okay, now we're going to take this blue-black wash again, shake it up, shake it, shake it, shake it. Now, hear that? There's a couple glass bead agitators in here, just to make sure. And then, there we go, that should be enough for the, next, for the last two figures. Take this and just start brushing across the figure. Now, when you're if you're going to make up your own wash to permanently store, like I did, make sure you are using distilled water, not faucet water. It won't matter at first. But after a few weeks, the various impurities in faucet water will start to react with the uh, stuff in the paint, with the stuff in your flow aid, whatever. Even organic impurities could start to corrode and, and uh, rot. And these impurities will result in a rotten smelling wash. It's really nasty. And we don't want that. Can your hair survive damage? Self Excuse me. That's why I wasn't talking for a minute, is I was uh, about to sneeze. Now, one thing about painting metal is that you have a choice. There's true metallic metal, which is basically using paints that have mica or uh, aluminum flakes in it that give it a reflective metallic look. The other option is called non-metallic metal, and that is using regular paints, but painting a permanent highlight and shadow onto the figure. Just to say, I am of the mindset that true metallic metal is better for figures you will use in a game. Because you never know what angle they're going to be viewed from, etc. Non-metallic metal is better for figures and other things that you won't because you know things like uh, busts or dioramas 
where light is always coming from a given direction. But again, that's a personal decision. There are plenty of people out there who recommend non-metallic on everything and people who recommend true metallic on everything. Go with what feels right for you. I will not teach any non-metallic metal techniques because I'm not really good at them. However, a lot of non-metallic metal techniques do work well with true metallic metal, so, you know, it's a six of one, half a dozen of the other. For example, changing the shading of the metal to match what's around it. If your guy's wearing mostly red, having a faintly red tint to the metal on part of his armor can emphasize that, you know, so that it's reflecting that red. If he's walking across a glowing arcane floor on the base of your figure, well, you can give him some underlighting by making your true metallic metals brighter on the bottom instead of the top. Hey! No, it's a gray primer. Now, like I was saying, what I'm doing here, I'm giving it a black wash, all of them a black wash, because what this does, this picks out all the detail, and uh, it also puts little uh, black lines around everything so I can cheat a little bit and not have to make sure that everything is exactly perfectly aligned to where it's going to be. Now, that's miniature number, th number four. And then finally number five. This Bowman here. And we're going to go ahead and give him his wash. Yes, always wash orcs. Because orcs usually need a bath. Now, as I said earlier, I have two different uh, water, water cups here. One for metallics and one for non-metallics. And yes, inks count as non-metallic, unless you've done and added something to them. Now, I noticed when I started painting them that I kind of used the advanced bow twice. Instead of having, like, say, this one using the, the medium tier bow. Yes, there is a crude tier bow. But, anyway... Okay. And I'm almost done with him. Now the idea is that by doing five at once, when I get done with number one, number five, number one will be dry again. This kind of doesn't always work when you're dealing with these full miniature washes like this. And especially when number one was a really big boar rider. Okay. Okay. You will notice like I said before, I'm not painting the, the base until I'm done with the rest of it. Simply because I'm of the opinion that this base is just, you know, it, it's subservient to the miniature. It's not 
the point of a miniature. You want to focus most of your painting. The higher you go, the more detail. The face is the focus for almost any humanoid miniature, whether an orc or a human or an elf. So that's what we want to focus most of our attention on when we're painting. And we want to try to draw the eye to that. That's where we're going to be putting most of our detail. So by making the rest of the miniature dark, slightly darker, slightly duller, less saturated, the eye goes to the face. Okay. And that is miniature number five. Well, see, just giving everything a black wash is not a good way to shade, because you don't want, like, reds don't look good. See, this is what happens with the black wash. You can see how everything is really popping already. Okay. Now, the problem is, this one's still wet. It's still got some areas that are puddled. Miniature number two is likewise still wet. So what we're going to do is I'm going to... Whoa! Don't do that. I'm going to pull out... Uh, one of my older figures. This sucker. This is an FDM print that I did about two years ago. It is a Dragonborn Druid. Yes, Druid. And this is actually an old paint job from my point of view. This is not up to my current standards. And I've got a Carlton, as if you couldn't tell. I had to have a Carlton. Hey, baby. Beep, beep. Beep, beep. Yes. Now, I'm going to detach your claw from my sleeve. And let's scoop you down. Get on down. Okay, the next one, I should also note, I keep a roll of toilet tissue down here, not for any other reason, but simply, when I put that wash on all of these figures, it kind of splattered a little bit, so I just want to make sure that it's not in these other ones. By the time I come around here, it'll be totally dry. This is going to be the color that we're going to be painting the actual fig actual skin tone. Okay. Now it's showing up a little pale and a little desaturated. I think I can go ahead and tweak my That's pretty close to what it's supposed to be. Oh, come on. Goblin Green. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take this Goblin Green, drop some right in here, and we're going to add just a few, couple drops of this. Now this already has the, the, the percentages. Six and a half parts, out of ten parts, it's six and a half medium, three distilled water, and half a part of flow aid. That basically thins it down a little bit so that it flows smoothly over the miniature. We're not doing it for the sake of um, making it sink in. We're, what we're wanting is we're wanting the brush to flow smoothly. If we put this, especially from Army Painter, directly onto our figures, 
then the end result will be a globby mess with brush strokes easily visible. You know, if you, if you cross section it, it would you'd see the brush strokes just because we don't want that. We want some nice clean strokes. Now, looking at him, our first guy looks like his skin tone areas are mostly dry, but I can't take the risk yet. Nope. Still too... Now, the plan is, I'm going to do everybody's skin tone. After that, we're going to do everybody's unit color. And by that, I mean the army has to have... An army, if this is made as an, you know, a, a force to put on a tabletop, a unified color scheme is what you want. So what you do, you pick a secondary color besides the skin. And in this case... Excuse me. A lot of people go with red. I'm not. I'm going to be going with purple. Again, this is looking a little blue because of the uh, the lighting, but the label is about right for what the paint actually looks like. This is going to be a purple. And then there's going to be blues and reds to, for additional things, just to be like bits and pieces. And as usual, the rims I'm going to paint a bright color in this case. To delineate, like, this guy will be part of a unit of archers, so he'll have a certain color for his base rim. Now, once again, I have a metal agitator in this bottle. It is hematite. Hematite does not rust, and it is heavy as all get out, and just... Go to, like, Michael's or some place that has cheap costume jewelry. You can get a whole string of hematite beads. Cut one into the string, and then just put the beads into the bottles. Now, again, this is going to be for all of the skin on all of these figures. And the tribal orc, at the very least, has a lot of skin showing. So... Let's go ahead and put some. All right. Hold on a second. Got to do one thing real quick. Make sure you shake it down to the base. Because sometimes your agitator will find itself... There we go. Sometimes your agitator will find itself stuck up in the neck. And if that happens, you squirt it. Now, we've got our glaze medium. Shake it. Now, we don't have... There's no actual exact formula of 3 to 1 paint to medium. You want to just add a little bit of it. No, we're not going to be using this brush for it because that's too too uh, large a brush. We're going to be going with a more an even more even brush. Where is it? Yeah, here we go. This is a size one brush. What we're going to do is we're going to mix it up. We're going to mix up the medium and water, medium and water, and the paint. And then we're going to bring a little bit down the paper. And we can see, okay, that's thin enough. It's not too thin either. It's about right. It's a little, a little translucent because we're going to need to use several coats. So what we're going to do now is we're going to start painting it on... There we go. We're going to start painting the green on the orc's body. On the, on the areas that will be green. I'm 
one thing to remember is that multiple coats is always best. The reason is that multiple coats you have you end up with the absolute minimum thickness possible paint to cover the area to opacity. And it's smooth. And by smooth, I mean it doesn't have the uh, brush strokes in it. Also, we are starting with the skin because you always go from the inside out. There are exceptions, like I said, like in this case where we're giving it a, an actual dedicated unit secondary color. Now, with orcs, your primary color is always going to be the green of the skin. The secondary color will be your actual unit color. Pardon me for a second. Once again, my sinus is acting up. With humans, elves, dwarves, pretty much anyone else with what humans would consider a normal skin tone, your skin tone is not your primary color. Instead, you've got to make sure that you've actually got a primary color. And, you know, for example, blue and gold for a human royal guard unit. Or blue and white, for or white and blue, rather, white primary, blue secondary, for a, for a high elf force, especially from uh, the Warhammer world. Uh, red and and uh, black for an evil force. Evil, and I don't mean evil like absurd. I mean evil, actually evil. And then we're gonna go in, make sure that we get this painted. This orc doesn't have a lot of skin showing, thankfully. It's got mostly armor. It also doesn't really have the secondary color in very many places. What we can do is determine that some of the areas that don't have plates under the arms, for example, at the shoulders under here, we can paint them as if they were cloth and use the secondary color there, the purple. We can paint the saddle purple and then of course the that leather. Now we've got the green painted the boar will be mostly browns. Now this guy is next and he is still not quite dry. He's still a little sticky, so we're going to have to wait some more. The longest amount of waiting when you're painting a miniature is when you're waiting on a wash to dry. Fortunately, we're not even half, we're barely more than half an hour in, so we got plenty of time to get continuing on the uh, the painting of these guys. like on this guy. Both the wood for the mahuatl and the color of the uh, waist cloth could be that purple. The chest piece would be more of a bone colored and you know that sort of thing. I really like how it's really capturing the detail on this guy too. The the combination of the wash and the new camera. So anyway. In case you're wondering, I put this on top of my soda so that it's less likely for one of these fuzz butts to knock it over. They avoid it for some reason when it's got that box on there.
Earlier today, she was hyperactive. Now the biggest puddle right now is actually right at the base of the hand in the Mahuatl. Right in here. So what I'm going to do is get a damp brush, wipe it off, kind of spin it through my finger and the knuckle below it, and draw off some of that. Paint it onto my piece of paper down here. And just go through some more of these little areas that are a little bit too puddly and draw off some of the paint because by now it's, it is where it needs to be. I mean, even the bottom of it is most, bottom of that, that puddle right here is mostly dry. But it also really shows off the stitching. Okay, set him down here. By doing this, I maintain my point because I'm spinning it as I'm pulling it back. And I'm also getting most of the brush off. No, so the paint off, rather. Okay. The only real major areas here... Again, this is just a basic uh, wash. This is not needed for shading. We're going to be painting over almost all of this. We don't need it to be perfect. And also, drawing the paint off like this works best with a slightly damp brush because a fully wet brush won't draw anything and a dry brush well it kind of doesn't really it only starts to go in a little bit of water and it's like it breaks the seal okay now this guy you got a little bit under here and up here down here at the bottom of the seal just getting some brush it off A little bit down here. And not too many other places for him. He's most he's gonna be probably dry soon. And this guy. Yeah, we've got quite a bit around the base of the belt. And the base of the neck. and the hand where it's holding the bow and under the bow now the only reason I'm doing this is because this is not I repeat not the final shading this is not even the initial shading this is just a real quick hey let's just slap it on I should also note that if you'll look carefully you'll see that this one's thumb right there flattened during printing oh well number one these things happen and number two I can always just simply take the pictures at angles like that because that's still a pretty dramatic angle of these the boar is one of my favorites but it's got a problem you see the ones that I actually printed out into the individual pieces and assembled which are these three. Right here. Have problems. If you look in the back, you can see that big old gap where the arm meets the chest. You can already see the gap over here. And on the back, it's even worse. And on this one, he doesn't quite fit on the saddle. That's because of tolerances. Sometimes the tolerances don't match with what you're doing. Okay. So it's actually, right now, this is one of my favorites of the ones that I've done. Because he's got that skull, belly plate, 
the fancy wooden shield that I'm going to be able to paint whatever I want on, and the, the, the choppa axe. Okay, let's look on this figure. Oh, also, it's not a good idea to leave your brushes like that. And it's still got a little bit of damp spots, but it's almost dry, and when this is dry, the other three will almost certainly be. I'm going to go in here and just remix up this paint in this part of the t palette. And actually, I'm going to go ahead and check to see, did it dry on the this guy? Yeah. We can actually go ahead and start his second coat while we're waiting. So, what we'll do is we just go ahead and just put a second coat on, and you'll notice it's a lot, it's like double as bright, twice as bright already on that hand. And the purpose of this is we want to make sure that this is smooth and opaque. That's why we're doing multiple thin coats. Some colors you really can't do this with. Yellows. Before you put on the yellow and, and uh, start painting it, you actually have to put on like a, 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 a tan or a medium color. A, medium light, a light medium color because... Yellow, no matter how many coats you put over this dark gray, will be pretty weak. Uh, a good rule of thumb is if it's taking more than four, more than three coats to put on for it to be opaque, you might have thinned it down a little too much. And it's also possible I may have. You don't want to pool it or puddle it. Because that will start caking in detail. Which means, before I start these others, well, let me cap, cap that. Need to add in a little bit more of this. And let's. Okay. Now, set this aside. Go back to my sinuses. It is 8.49. What I'll normally do is I'll paint and then I will go and start doing something that will take me a good while. Watching a, a, a TV show or, you know, whatever. Go run errands after I've done the wash step. Okay, now I've already added in more paint to thicken this up. So let's mix it. You'll hear painters talking about milk consistency or cr heavy cream consistency. Well, that's just... It's, 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 very, it's still very abstract. Whatever they say, you can't judge just by that. You've got, you got to get in there, take a little bit of it, push it around plastic, see how it goes, push it around paper, see how it goes. And I'm thinking it's almost time. So we're going to go ahead and start painting his skin. Now he's got a lot of skin showing. Most of his chest is showing. Or back, rather. So we're just going to go ahead and paint as much as we can. It's still a little thin, but oh well. And once again, we are not wanting to pool like we do with a wash. This is, excuse me, this is for coverage that we're going for. We want it to be even. If we let it pool, it'll build up in there. And we don't want that.
And the purpose of thinning is to make it easier to cover the whole figure without leaving brush strokes. You can tell the difference between a miniature that was painted with thinned paint and one that wasn't. Now there are some paints that, that are pre-thinned, but those usually have less of a matte finish, and I prefer the matte finish that, say, Army Painter or Viejo kind of gets when you thin it down and uh, paint it. Army Painter is really thick, really needs to be uh, thinned down. Viejo, not as thick, and it also includes, that has a line called Viejo Air. Viejo Air is exactly what it sounds like. It's, it's thinned down for airbrush use, but even then it's not thin enough for airbrush. But it's pretty much thin enough for painting. The biggest problem with Viejo Air is that it's, well, it's shiny. Now, since this is the first actual color, I can be sloppy. I can just slap this on and kind of smooth it out. Okay. Now, this arm... At this, thi at this thickness, the paint will do what's called auto-leveling. This has nothing to do with what happens to your print bed. What it means is it, it's fluid enough for it to flow to an even top level. And then we're going to do the legs. Once again, this is just the first coat on him. There are going to be at least two or three, at least three coats, probably. Okay, and there. Now we got to make sure that we are got everything at least one coat on. Okay, put him down. Now we have our basic archer. Let's refocus the... There we go. I'm going to rinse off the brush just so that we have... You know, we don't have it building up on the brush. Now we're going to go ahead and start painting the figure. Putting that green on the skin. It's a green skin for a reason. Now, what I'm going to be doing, and I actually probably won't have time to do the full thing with this with these guys, but I will be doing after this green is on the uh, the goblin green. I'm going to give it a lot, couple layers of layering to a hot, brighter shade with scaly hide as a highlight color. Once I've done that, then I'm going to add in a little bit of necrotic flesh, which is an even paler green. And then I'm going to be giving it a wash of a Viejo shade called black green. And the end result of that is it keeps the green tint. Then, on certain areas, like the cheeks, the lips, <laughs> I'm going to be using red wash. Because the end result will be a really kind of cool effect. Let's put that there. That kind of makes him look a little bit more alive, even though these guys probably have green blood. Just humans see red and think alive.
Now, let's bring this up here. And brace this on. And now the legs, because this guy's not wearing pants. Because orcs don't like pants. Orcs prefer to feel the wind on their nethers. Of course, orc nethers are not something you ever want to consider. Half orcs, I don't want to know. Okay. Now that needs to dry. Making sure it doesn't build up on the brush before we move to the next one. And you can, this one really, really printed well, and this one also really captured that paint well. Now, he's wearing a shirt, so we don't need to worry about the sleeves or the back or the chest, but we do need to worry about the elbows. Because those elbows kind of poke out, and we need to worry about the head. Now, for him, it's just his ears in his face and he's got that evil smiley grin oh hold on sinus is dripping I may have made this too thin Okay, I really should have done the uh, the black wash before, well before this show. It would have saved me a lot of time. Okay, now we're gonna come up the hand. Mom is watching that show about uh, bar rescue. All I can think is I hate that guy. He's a douchebag. He automatically starts off by going straight to treat them like garbage until they t t turn around instead of treat them like a human being so that they can learn what's going on just because it makes better television. Okay, and then finally down here. And now one more. That's this guy. And once again, we're going to rinse off the brush so we don't have the paint build up inside the ferrule. See, look how clean that brush is. And that's a clean brush. And now we're going to paint on the skin. He's also wearing a shirt, thankfully, but he's also wearing pants. So he will not be using uh, he will not have green legs. He will not have green legs and hams. He will not have them, Sam I am. Okay. Now his elbow. Weep, weep, weep. 
weep, weep, wee 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 wee, twiddly dilly dee, twiddly dilly dee, twiddly dilly dee, twiddly dilly dee. that and now the right arm once again we got elbow and the hand Okay, all of them have one layer of the green stuff on the skin. While we're doing this, if any of y'all have any questions about anything with painting or sculpting or any of this, please ask. Like, uh, are any of y'all going to Adepticon? Also, let's go ahead and remix this, because it will start to separate. To our third st third layer on this guy. There we go. Now, since this is going to be just for a quick mass production bit, when it comes time to do the uh, shape, the, the highlighting, we're not going to do actual layering. Instead, we're going to do dry brushing. And then we're going to finish. Okay. The final green on him is relatively opaque, so we're going to stick with that. Now we have our tribal boy. With his second coat. I'm going to go ahead and paint it on, making sure to cover the entirety of the green. Now, when you get to this point, it will look like you've lost all your detail. That's because you're comparing it to the really sharp detail from the wash next to it. You haven't, trust me. By thinning the, if, as long as you have your paint thinned, you have not lost your detail. Also, when you first brush it on, it may look like for a fraction of a second that you've got brush strokes. Once again, you don't. It, as long as you've got your paint thinned, it will self-level, and those brush strokes will go away. Okay, and then we come down this way.
Anyway. So, we're getting the last little bit of the second coat onto this guy with the green. Anyway, okay, there we go. That's number two. And a sinus. Don't forget to speak up if you've got any questions, because when it's sitting there saying, I vote for boar, I'm kind of wondering if anyone's actually, like, you know, died on me. Now, we're going to put on this next level of layer on number four, number three. Um, show that she's watching in there. Okay. And then this one, this hand. By the way, uh, well, I'm sitting here painting orcs and discussing them. Like next up is the uh, next layer for the Greek for the skin on this guy. Blah. Blah. So always thin your paints. Rinse your brush. If you're painting multiple things that are using the same, rinse your brush between so that you at least, you know, your brush doesn't build up on the thingy. So now, putting at least two coats on every bit of green on these green skins. After that, we'll start working on some highlighting some dry brushing to be exact and then we're going to work on giving them a wash it's always a good idea in my opinion to go from inside out when painting and it doesn't matter if you go do everything's first coat do everything's second coat do everything's third coat or do just the skin first second highlight shade etc it's just what you're most comfortable doing. Because we're not trying to teach people how to win the crystal brush or the demon or the golden demon. We're trying to teach people just how to, you know, get their miniatures on the table. By painting multiple figures at once, you save a lot of time and you can get it all done. Get her done. Yeah. But that's all there was, that's quick. And now this one. Um, right now, uh, one, two, three, four, five of the ones that I have printed from my current set. I have some back in the uh, bookcase here from the previous Orc Horde. That's probably about seven or eight. 
but no, oh, ten, closer to ten. So right now I don't exactly have an orc army. This is just random orcs. Great for D&D, not so great for Warhammer. Okay. Now, let's get this in here. If I was ever working at a bar and I saw John Tapper come in because they were going to do bar rescue in the bar I'm working on, I would end up getting arrested. Because I'd probably deck the SOB. Because I really can't stand him. He's a total douchebag who, think, who can get away with what he does because it's good TV. Okay, that's number two for those guys. How many could I throw the party at once? Uh, well, let's see. I, I have, of course, the, the various sergeants in that that I printed on my CR-10 and painted. These are about a year and a half old. Or about a year old. Before I got my uh, resin printer, I've got a. Oh come on! There we go. A few unpainted FDM orcs, pretty poorly printed. A few painted. FDM regular orcs. And a few unpainted resin orcs. That was stupid. I left the brush sit in the... Br Never let your brush sit in the water. That's a bad idea. All right. Now, this guy has already had his third layer. And it's looking pretty opaque, except for on the hands. Just a little bit on the hands. Okay. Other than that, it's pretty good. Okay. So now we're going back to him. Is he dry? Yes, he's dry. So we go in, and there's some areas where we need to go ahead and give that third coat to, like the corners of the jaw, and eyebrows and nose. I think we want to make sure that it's, it's all smooth. Now, some of you heard this earlier in the show. After having printed them and assembled them and now painting them, it is my recommendation, if you end up getting this orc set, to assemble them in your modeling software of choice and then send them to your slicer and print them. Because otherwise, there are bad seams. I mean, case in point, look right here. Me. You know, look right here. A very bad scene. Because of the tolerances of different printers. In this case, it's because, well, I was super gluing it and I just slapped it on. I got a little bit hasty. Now, this needs a little bit on the hands, a little bit on the face. 
this last third coat is pretty much just putting a little bit on the areas that really need it most. Okay. Okay. Now, I will probably have these painted and done before my next show. Because I can't afford to take the time to just let them wait on painting. Because i got to get them all done as soon as possible. So, my next show, I'll be able to show off what I've done. I must confess I am rather biased towards the Anycubic having having had one and not being a techie. I can't have my resin printer in here because, you know, it's right next to my bedroom. But Yeah. It, the fact is that it doesn't need tethering, which is my single biggest reason why I think it's better than the one how D7. And by not needing tethering, <clears throat> I can just slap some files on the thumb drive. Pop it in the side, turn it on, and tell it, print away. Alright. It's now 20 after 9, and let's look to see if this guy's last layer is done. It's still a little damp. Now what we're going to do is we're going to let it dry. And we're going to come in and we're going to dry brush it with this. <sighs> this is Scaly Hide from. There you go, from Army Painter. Pardon me for a moment. I think it's all the mess of resin. The Indycubix is the closest thing to a printer everyone could have that I can think of. But the mess, the cleanup, and the post-processing, yeah. I should note about that... Uh, resin orc that I showed up close from the original orc horde. This sucker. If you look at it when it focuses, you can easily see the layer lines when I hit it just the right angle. There. That is what happens with 0.05 layer height 
on an anycubic photon, laying mostly on its back. And you see what it does with the shield, because the shield is curved. Yeah. But when you look at it at a more reasonable size, you pretty much can't see it. I should note that price was not a, a, a problem for me for one primary reason. I sort of got sponsored by any cubit. Anyway, let's go ahead and bring him back out. And we're going to break open my dry brush. Now there's a few different, I have a few different sizes of dry brush. These are mostly just older brushes that I, you know, just don't think are have a good point anymore. This one. Yeah. I mean that's why I've got the uh, the symbol down there. Yeah, because it says any cubic. What amazed me, now with dry brushing, do not thin paint that you're going to be using for dry brushing. Because it defeats the purpose. Once again, see how I'm kind of flicking the, the bristles. Tap it. I'm tapping into the paint. This paint is a little bit greener than it looks on camera. I'm going to wipe it off. I spin forward then back and like that. Then I'm just gonna drag down. And then once again we go. Spin it and pull and dra drag. That gets most of the most of the uh, paint off. And we're going to dry brush across the fingers. Just drag it in one direction. Occasionally flipping the brush because it will leave more paint on one side than the other. Okay, and that's a little bit closer. You can see that it's picked up some of that lighter green on the uh, ridges. We're going to do that with this. Now we're going to do a pretty much mostly, a pretty heavy dry brush with this green because we're going to be going back with a lighter green and doing a very light dry brush only on the edges Anyway, yeah, Mom's watching something about the Manson family now. Now, to remember, one thing to remember is that a lot of these lighter colors will dry darker whereas some dark colors will dry lighter. And you never know which is which until you use it. And I gotta wipe my sinuses again.
Yay! So let's... And let's dry brush it across the hand. Get these fingers out. set him back. Rinse off the brush so it doesn't get too nasty. Now as you can see, this brush is kind of dark near the ferrule, which is the metal part. Because it's old, it's, it's, it's starting to wear out. <sighs> Time to draw brush this guy. We're going to go through a couple brushfuls of this simply because with a wet brush it'll won't dry brush well. Then we're going to come in and dry brush down. Okay. Now one thing I've noticed is I accidentally painted part of what will be his shirt green. Oh well. That's this area right here. Let me. Yeah, you can see this area right in here is actually has a, a seam there. Now once again we come, come down, so it's coming from one direction. And then across the knees. Okay. A little bit more. Okay. Now comes. Mr. Sword and Shield, or Axe and Shield, rather. And we're going to, once again, kind of twist it back and forth, get it off my brush, and then just dry brush down. Now this guy. This is the last of this color, which is coincidentally the last time we're going to need it on this guy. We used just enough. Yay. Okay, we're going to draw down. Actually, we might need a little bit more. But yeah.
Now, this will not be an even blend on this figure. This figure is a quickie display, a, a tabletop level figure, not a competition figure. Okay, and that's actually just in time as we ran out of the one color. Now, we're moving up to necrotic flesh with a bit of jungle green, a little really bright, bright green. I probably have enough kitty hairs to make a new brush. Don't I? Yeah. Yes. Kitty kisses. Yeah. Good girl. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of do a little bit of a 50 50 mix of this bright green bright yellow green and this uh, really pale green and what we want to do is we want to kind of just to give this a little bit of a, 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 a healthy glow a sickly healthy glow because the uh, yeah there we go There we go. And then we're going to wipe it off and do a light coat down. Only on certain areas. It looks kind of messy right now, but that's because we're not done yet. We're far from done. But you can see it's already looking a little bit healthier. Less undead orc. Same here. We're going to take it. We're going to bring it down lightly across the highest points of the face. in the top of the ear, or edge of the ear. Just kind of brush it down across these other areas will help give it some uh, tint. Now, the reason we're doing the dry brush, then the wash, is something that's been said. Wash, then dry brush, it looks dry. Dry brush, then wash, it looks wet or smooth, clean. And we want it to look more clean even though it's orcs. So, just real quick, we did base coat, a single highlight, and then a really bright highlight with some yellow added, or yellowish. And then we're going to do a wash here in a little bit. On and then once it's dry, we're going to do a wash only of only on certain areas now notice that we're doing pretty pretty quick now that we don't have a wash to deal with well guess what we're getting ready to right, we're going to come down
And then this guy. And we got to bring it down on the edges. And then across the fingers, because this guy doesn't have a doesn't have a lot of Okay, there we go. And that was that. Now, we're coming back to our big boar buddy. Well, considering that this is, like I said, just a... Uh, a you know, just a, a sample, just you know, a, a low-tier paint job... Three shades of green plus a wash, which in this case is the ahem, black green from Viejo Gaming. If you see that little AV sign, that's Viejo. Shake it till I can hear the rattler. Okay. Now, we're going to put the dry brush aside again, because it's not the brush we're going to use. We're going to go back to that 1.0 brush I was using, this one, and you're going to use this. We're going to put it directly over this. and we're going to let it settle into the cracks and crevices just like because this is an actual wash it's not like the wash we did at the start this is one where we want it to shade we want it to be very even so we don't want to just let it slop and slobber You know, that's something... That commercial just brought up something that uh, everyone should be aware of. If you are t going to take any kind of medication, let your doctor know not just what official medications you're taking, but also what herbal supplements you're taking. Because if you're taking something that has a reaction to, say, vitamin C, and you're taking rosehip pills, which are vitamin C... You can have problems. He's listening to a commercial that on the show mom's watching. Now this is almost done, the skin. There'll be some reddening. And that's about it. We actually, we might go back in and give a little bit more highlight on some areas, but that's pretty much nice and straightly clean and shaded. Anyway, what this does, it not only because it's green, it helps rebind this back down to a, to the uh, orky shades that we're used to seeing. So that really, really bright we were building up to. But it also blends that uh, difference between the uh, light and dark that we were having. It was a rather extreme difference. And then what will happen after this is done, I'm going to break out the red ink. 
And we're going to be putting that on, like I said, like on the on the cheeks and the lip. Just to give it kind of a, a just to give it some uh, flavor and some color variation. Okay. Okay, and now the legs. And I'm gonna have to go ahead and add some more black ink onto my onto my uh, or gr green black ink onto my palette. This green black ink is like ideal for orcs, and it's not in the oh, it is in the game color line. Where did it go? There it is. Right now, since I'm using the green first before anything else, just paint over it. That's why you go from inside out. Because what ends up happening is, you know, if I go, if I accidentally paint this shirt over top of the skin, you know, if I paint the purple of the shirt that I'm going to use over top of the skin on the arm here, then all I got to do is uh, use a really dark green, and it just looks like it's part of the shadow. And I just heard about the worst salt possible. Tequila salt. It's actually the worm from the agave plant ground up with salt. That just sounds so terrifyingly disgusting. And then down there. Okay, that's that. Uh, now, odds are that me painting on the ink on the last orc will coincide with the end of the show simply because it's already 9.45. And that means that it's getting close to uh, bedtime. Or at least end of show time. I have nothing against Showtime, I just don't think it's as good as HBO, but anyway. And of course, none of it's as good as Skinamax. Too many fond memories as a kid of trying to, to see what was going on behind that weird, distorted image. Listening to the sounds of things that was forbidden to me. Yes, we all did it as a kid in the 80s. Okay. 
set this down. And it's time for this guy. Hey, Mark. Oh, no. It's for washes and dry brushes. Or for either for, for, for inks that are designated a wash. Like this. I use it straight out of the pot. But this right here. That. That is almost half of this. Which is six and a half parts medium, three parts water, distilled water, and half a part flow aid. And that thins it down and lets it paint, paint on smoothly. No brush strokes. If I was only putting down one drop of paint, for example, if I was only painting one figure and I didn't need a lot for the uh, leather, then it's two drops of, of uh, paint for one drop of this, or instead, if it's only one drop on the palette, then it would be a drop elsewhere on the palette, and then I dip my brush in it before I put it into the paint. Okay. Now, almost done with the uh, ink on this guy. And then the elbow here. Then we rinse off the brush. Never mash it. You kind of want to stroke it, set it strokes against the side. Now notice it's already building up some of that ink near the ferrule. There is a bit of soap that you can I can use to clean that off. And it's already coming off. Now Look at the uh, this guy right here. You can see that it's got a bit of a shade to it. It's got the you know you got a clear bit going from high to low. The light is really kind of breaking the, the, the shading up badly. Uh, anyway. Kiki? There we go. And as some of you can see, now I actually have a better camera now. And my sinuses are draining. Alright. You. Good. Let me move this out to there. Okay. So. The one thing I'd like to say, once again, I said it earlier at the 1 o'clock show, and I said it earlier in this show. No, Largash, there's no fumes from water-based paint. No, what it is, it's the change in pressure. The change in pressure, in barometric pressure in my area, from the change from winter to spring. My sinuses, see how my nose kind of goes like that? Yeah, I've got deviated septum. Now, what I was going to show you, these two archers, this one, 
was printed out in multiple pieces and then uh, glued together. This one was put together inside my modeling program. Now, I'm going to show you their backs. Come on, focus. Notice that it's got cracks at the shoulders. Whereas this one... Come on. Doesn't. This one was assembled in my modeling program. I just put them together there and printed it out. So it is my recommendation, my strong recommendation, that the miniatures be assembled in your modeling program before you uh, print them out. Largash, that's just playing Warhammer Fantasy Battle with everyone using the Orc Army. I mean, you choose how many boys, how many error boys, how many biggins, how many boar boys, how many, you know, a whole nine yards. You got a certain number of points to build your army with. Now, it would take longer for all of this wash to dry than I have time for. But the next step would be to go back on the brows, nose, and cheeks, and the knuckles of the fingers with a really bright green. Board game or tabletop game? Because there's a big difference between a board game and a tabletop game. Board games are like Monopoly, Ticket to Ride, Diplomacy, Risk. Tabletop games, you have your tabletop role-playing games like D&D and, and, and you know, games like that. Tabletop war games like Warhammer 40k and Warhammer Fantasy. And I've actually played more Warhammer Fantasy than I have played Warhammer 40k. Mostly because I find Warhammer 40k to be highly annoying. The same reason I don't like... Uh, okay, then D and D, without a doubt, D and D. I mean, right now, especially. Right now, I've got a game from about four to nine on Wednesday at Wednesday evenings. Four is when we start showing up. Gameplay actually starts at six, but we're all hanging out and shooting the breeze first. And then, from Sunday, from noon until 6. So, two different games. Oh, and Sunday, we have two different game masters. If one of them is, is working, the other one takes over. So I've got two different characters. I'm running three characters right now. Character number one on Wednesdays is a, a Eldritch Knight fighter who's neutral good. And is a very, very moral being. The party fighter is taking lessons in non-lethal conflict resolution. And we're getting ready to go into Undermountain. The second one is the standard, or the average, get character on Saturdays, who is a wizard with one level of rogue just to get expertise in arcana and perception. So at ninth level, he's eight wizard evoker, first thief, and he's got expertise in arcana and perception. So his arcana is plus twelve, and his perception's plus eleven. Yeah. And then when that game master can't make it, we're doing the other one. I've got a wood elf paladin of the Elder Scrolls god Akatosh, god, the dragon god of time. Or Alduin, or uh, not Alduin, uh, uh, Ariel. 
And that game's got some weird characters. That game has a teddy bear barbarian. A ventriloquist dummy sorcerer. A half unicorn cleric. Half unicorn meaning like he's like a satyr with a horn. Uh, let's see. We got a feline centaur. Uh, I think monk. And a halfling rogue. So that one, that one's gonna get weird. And we're doing Lost Minds of Fandelver. Apparently I have dropped a total of 20 seconds worth of frames over the past two hours. That's not good. Now, I've got a brand new computer. I know it's not the computer. I mean, you look at my broadcast and it looks a lot neater and a lot more, a lot more animated than it was in the past. And, I mean, hey, it looks good. Look good. But, I'm still dropping frames, which means that it's it's YouTube. Uh-huh. All right, let's take a brief glance at uh, this guy. And as you can see, well, if he'll focus... Yeah, there he goes. And me... Yeah. There we go. He's got a nice shading to him already. Very distinct across the tabletop. Uh, hardline. Wi-Fi caps out at 50. My hardline caps out at almost 300. Uh, this ring is one I designed. I made the 3D model that made this ring. I then sent it to Shapeways and they printed out a bronze. And if I used a photon to make a ring, I already did. I got exactly my size without trying. Speaking of kitty cam, come on, little buddy. People want to see you this time. Yes. Big old demon yawn over there. Go on. Up. Here we go. Here's a Carlton. Uh. No, 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 no. The Green Lantern ring does not need to be metal. That would look bad. I don't like metallic Green Lantern rings. Oh, what are you doing? You know, they they look more plasticky. What are you doing, little buddy? Huh? Oh. <sighs> so here we have Carlton. Domesticus catus. Love Sleticus. Snuggle Sleticus. What are you doing? Ah, Yes. Ugh. Do you want me to kick Ben, you larg? This one's a boy. This is my little buddy. This is Carlton. On down. There you go. This one is 13. And as if you go back and watch the earlier show from 1 o'clock, she still got all the energy and, and, and uh, all of that. I mean, hopping from that bookcase to that bookcase would just bloop, racing up to here, racing back to there, bouncing down, hop, hop. Yeah. All of my cats are unusually affectionate. I don't know how I got so lucky with getting... I don't know if it was the way I raised them, 
what it was, but they're all really snugly. No. When they jump up, you'll notice there's at least a finger's width between all of these and the edge. And in this case, this one's too big, but all of the human size are fingers width or more back. I learned my lesson with some Transformers up here. By the way, anyone ever collects Transforming figures? Identify this guy. He's not a Transformer. It is a transforming figure, but it is not a transformer. Nope. This is not a gunplay. This is by Bandai, originally. And then it was brought over here under a different, different brand name by an American toy company in 1983, one year before Transformers. Yes, it is, Mark. But which one? This is a 1983 figure. Not a single bit of its chrome has started to peel. There's a couple chips of red paint missing, but not a single... Like, right, right there, right below my fingernail. But not a single bit of the chrome has started to peel. Even the sticker right here is mostly intact. To be exact, that's screw head. No Larganish, mostly because I'm not a fan of, of uh, painting uh, Gundam models, mostly because it's, the style is a totally different painting style than what's used for miniatures. Uh, it's closer to what's used for World War II tanks or Warhammer 40k vehicles. So, I was thinking... One thing I've done recently is I have changed how my goblins look. On the left is my old goblins. And they end up being a little thin and, and not quite so durable. And they were very fragile and finicky to print. On the right is my new goblins. Bigger head, bigger hands, bigger feet. Thicker arms and legs. Shorter torsos. And the end result is it's a more durable figure. Now, what I'm thinking about doing, I'm going to go ahead, the Orc Horde, all six billion potential combinations are going to be a Kickstarter. There's going to be a stretch goal, going to be a stretch goal for goblins. Now, the goblins will be top and bottom and head. The arms won't be a separate piece. And then a, another stretch goal for siege machines, catapults, trebuchets, ballistae, and the crew to go with them. And another stretch goal for war bosses. Not just sergeants. I mean, you can do a sergeant. I mean... If, if this guy here just had something in his right hand. He'd make instead of having a bow draw arm, if he had a right hand with a sword, he could make a good sergeant, just scale him te up ten percent. But war bosses. We're talking like this guy but better. Uah. 
Yeah, this is a horrible print because this was done on my FDM. Yes, Air Guitar. Air Guitar Orc is Air Guitar. No, he's going to be on something more like this. Not this guy exactly, but something like him. Actually, that'd be that'd be war bosses, and then there'd be the high war boss. This is one of my figures, by the way. He's on Thingiverse. And he does have scales. He is got splatter on him from when I was painting at one point, but yeah. Uh, Largash in Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Multiple orc personalities ride wyverns. Not, not dragons. Wyvern. There was a goblin warlord that did not, because he was too fat. He was even bigger than any orc. But it was all in his gut. Because what had happened, as a young gabo, on a dare, he ate a piece of raw troll flesh. And it's continually regenerating inside his stomach, so he never needs to eat again. But it's providing with so many calories that he grew grotesquely fat. He ended up sailing over to the High Elf Island trying to conquer it and got squished. The, well, Sandworm, there are multiple variants. In D&D &D alone, you've got the winter... In the, in, in the wintry areas, you've got what's called the Remmer has. Um... In the more desert areas, you have the purple worm. You know, there's several different variants. Welcome back, Carlton. Meow. <sighs> 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 This is typical for Carlton, for those of you who are new to the show. He is a very, very lovey-dovey kitty. Aren't you? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Now, let me tell you something about this cat. He's got remarkable claw control. To the point where he can grab my shirt without touching my skin. He's a Velcro kitty. Uh-oh. Yep. He did it. See, I do not declaw my kitties, as you can easily see there. I think it's cruel. Even if you, they use the new technique, which just removes the nail bed, instead of removing that last joint of the finger, it's still cruel. Because they end up with arthritis later in life. Yes. Sweet kitty. Love bite. 
If a cat bites you, but holds on, it just stops and holds on without putting any pressure, that's a play bite. That means they want to play and they love you. But yeah, also, cats are not nocturnal. They are what are called crepuscular. What that means is they are most active at dawn and dusk, and they rest in midday and midnight. Because the house cats we know and love and adore are descended from desert cats, which means that they avoided the heat of the day and the cold of the night by being active in the twilight hours when it was a medium temperature. Anyway, it is now quarter after ten. I'm going to go ahead and uh, refresh this just to make sure. There's about a ten second lag on, at, uh, on YouTube. I wanted to make sure that I dealt with that lag. So what ends up happening is, first of all, I'm going to have to wash all the paint off my hands. But I'm going to hold up my hand here, count from five to one. When I get to one, I'm going to say something goofy and go, ee, 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 ee. and then I log out when I can see my own finger going. Ee, 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 ee. We call them the house panthers. Meanwhile, so that is going to be a five, four, three, two. And a one. A friend of mine got a little itty bitty black kitty, named her Shuri, after the Black Panther's little sister. Took her to the vet to get fixed and got promptly informed that's not Shuri, that's T'Challa. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>